Welcome to the Midnight Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Easton Bennett, alongside my fellow co-host, Tyler Sinden. We are both entrepreneurs who are learning, growing, and building our own businesses. Our goal is to share our experiences and knowledge to help you grow and become a successful entrepreneur. Strap in. Before we get started, if you have any questions or things you'd like us to cover, you can email us at themidnightentrepreneur at gmail.com. If you'd like to join our business discord where we talk about wins, business problems, or general questions, shoot us a message and we will get you in there. Tyler, Friday night, almost Friday night. How's it going? It's Friday night over here. It's going pretty good. Been rather busy recently. What's going on with you? How are you doing? Not a whole lot. Uh, this week's been pretty busy. Uh, got back yesterday from a shoot out of town. And then today, just trying to catch up on emails, uh, sending out all the documents and getting things ready to go. But things are going good. Can't complain. That's good to hear. It's always good when things are going well. I've been a little bit busy at work and unfortunately this week I haven't been able to get much done say for my personal and all the stuff that I'd like to get done there but getting lots of it's weird I so I had I guess it's not weird but I had a day off on Monday and I think that made me behind a little bit at work which forced me to work a little bit extra during the days that I was working so yeah I've been pretty busy there and Took away time from outside of work. A given day off, or did you take a day off? Uh, it, it was I took the day off. Gotcha. Just cause. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Family member passed away. Oh, sorry to hear that, brother. Um, yeah. but hey, you got to uh, you got to catch up on uh, got to catch up on a little bit of work now. Uh, so yep. other than that, obviously you didn't catch up on a ton. What did you uh, catch up on? Yeah. So one thing that I. I just added this in because I remembered I want to start getting into personal branding more and actually getting back onto YouTube, creating short form content. I have been doing short form content the day ones, but those are more so just for my personal benefit to keep me disciplined and doing all the minutia tasks each and every single day and just maybe a little bit documenting the journey at the same time. So outside of that, I want to get back into YouTube. I filmed the other day. I think I think my personal branding is going to be somewhere around marathon training, Ironmans, that type of stuff, because I that's basically what my life is right now, outside of uh, work and creating a business. So I think that's what it's going to be. At the other day, I filmed a just a bunch of what I eat and drink during the day. So that's going to be probably my first video. And then I might start creating videos around marathon training and all that fun stuff. So yeah, that's what I've been. One thing that I wanted to start doing again. I was getting back into YouTube. I was thinking honestly about my own personal content as well. <laughs> I know I was doing, uh, I was doing a lot of those talking head clips and I was actually listening. I don't know if you've ever heard of the podcast, the 505 podcast, but basically, it's three video guys. One guy works for the Lakers. Uh, one guy used to shoot the concerts for Loud Luxury. And then the other guy is just kind of mm -hmm. like a corporate video guy. And they interview creatives and everything on there. And I was listening to their episode here the other day. And they were interviewing Jay Hawk or Johnny Hawkstetler, I think his name is. And he was talking about the grind that it is to create personal content. And then it got me thinking that he, when he started, when he was creating personal content, it was all about stuff he wanted to create right so not about stuff that he thought his audience would like so i think i want to start mm -hmm. creating more personal content not so much youtube but more so short form content that is stuff that i actually want to make because i was yeah. making those talking head videos and i was like ah, eh, i don't really know if this is uh something i love doing all the time so yeah i'm trying right. to find that balance that kind of struck a chord with me when i was listening to that yesterday yeah that makes sense and i think at the same time you're gonna find your audience and people might find enjoyment with it. And at the same time, when you find more enjoyment with it, it's going to make you more disciplined and consistent with it. Yeah. And I want to still tie it to the video production business in a way. So I'm thinking more so quick vlog style, uh, talking head stuff, some voiceover stuff. I don't know if you've seen Jack Cook. You used to be doing that. Weren't you doing that before? Yeah, a little bit, but it wasn't super. When it was just like it. here and there. Yeah. Started it for like five days. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, it was it was fine, but I didn't realize how much work it takes. So I'm thinking yeah. if I could just do a couple a week maybe that are still pretty high quality, that'd be kind of yeah. cool. But even when I was listening to that podcast with Jayhawk, 
he said that all of his content, he shoots just a bunch on like a Sunday or a Saturday. So that might be something mm-hmm. I could do where I shoot two or three, but doesn't have to be anything crazy where I'm going around the city with a vlog camera, but just stuff around the office right. that might be a 15, 20 second vlog uh, video. Have you ever done stuff like that where you're out out in public and you're, you got the camera up and you're recording those selfie videos? Have you ever done that before? When I first started my business, I uh, wanted to do like daily vlogs like Gary V did. So I don't uh-huh. know if they're still on YouTube or if they're unlisted, but I did a, I did a few of them. And it was super weird, man, walking around in public yeah. with a camera. I don't know if it was really for me. So, Right. I, I think it would be a little bit different if it's an actual camera compared to, say, your phone. Because I've been seeing videos before or recently where people will walk around with their phone and it's like, no one really cares. And they're just like talking to the camera. And at the same time, it, people might think that it's FaceTime. But when you got a camera, especially like the camera you got... It's a little bit bigger than a phone and it's a lot, it, it grabs a lot more attention. So yeah, I, I, I definitely do feel you there where it's a little bit more awkward when you have a camera and you're walking around and it's like, what's this guy doing? What's this clown? Thinks he's a, is he a big shot, big shot filmer, <laughs> big shot YouTuber, influencer. Yeah. It's hard to pass that off as uh FaceTime. That's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I I've been trying, I, so I got lucky because I did create a, like a little bit of a backlog with uh, my marketing podcast for my business. And I've actually been getting a couple comments, I which is kind of cool. Um, a few of them, maybe not so nice ones, but uh, I, I got one actually recently and he actually gave me an idea. I did have the idea already, but doing... Uh, it's going to lead into our news topic, but doing one on Twitter rebranding to X. And he's like, I feel like this would be right up your alley for that. And I'm like, I appreciate the idea. So it was cool to get actually engagement on that. You're like, I already had that idea, man. It's on my list. (laughs) Exactly. I didn't really say it like that, but I I kind of did say it like that. (laughs) And that'll happen. I think that'd be a good idea. Um, I was listening. So yesterday I had a shoot uh yesterday or i guess it was yesterday i felt like it's weird because i woke up at 2 a.m yesterday and shot from 5 to 12 so all my days are all mumbo jumbo but i was listening to uh, the bud light podcast put out i thought that one was pretty good um but yeah i mean i think yeah i think the x i appreciate that yeah i i see it i always scroll through and i see it in the new episodes i'm like all right i'll throw it on um (laughs) but yeah it was it was good so i think the x would be a good topic for that yeah, that was one of the, it was more, it was on the short form content. Someone on TikTok commented like, buddy, this has already been covered three months ago. And I'm like, yeah, thank you. I just started my business. I thought it would be a good topic to cover, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much what I said. Yeah. Hey, that's all right. You can never be uh, too late to the game now. I mean, the first one that I did was from a commercial from like three years ago. So I'm slightly late there. <laughs> yeah. Even if like people are going to come back and they're like, Oh, five years from now, they're like, Oh, let's go listen to a podcast about the Bud Light thing or whatever. Yeah. If there's a month discrepancy, whatever. I think those are evergreen though, in a sense, because maybe the short form content's a little bit different, but the actual marketing implications that I talk about is evergreen because it's that one's talking about your target audience. The other one was talking about target audience, perfect timing and all this other stuff and planning. So I think they are in a sense evergreen if they, even if they are on topics that were years ago, it's just not as timely. People don't understand that. That's see that uh, they just want to comment and be uh, dickheads per se. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We appreciate them though. Yeah. any, Any publicity is good publicity, right? Exactly. (laughs) But as far as going into the uh, Beyond Meat shoot that I was on yesterday, kind of a cool experience because it was a bigger shoot. Not bigger shoot as far as crew and equipment goes, but they flew in a director and a DP uh, from L.A. And they also had uh, another guy that flew in from L.A. And they brought a Red Raptor, which is like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. They brought a cinema lenses, a whole case of them, six of them that are each $10,000. And they were shooting on these. And I was pretty much a glorified production assistant uh, helping them. But super cool to see. I'm glad I could bring some of my equipment. We used my Dana Dolly. We used a couple of reflectors. So didn't didn't use a ton of it, but it was good to see that process and some of the creative shots that they were doing. They were doing some shots that I never would have even thought of. Uh, so that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. And uh, to learn from those guys, uh, kind of see how that process works. I, I 
I, I very much enjoyed it, you could say. What were some of the things that you learned on the shoot or that you took away from Just being the, with those guys? Yeah, the director had one. He had an iPad with... I don't know what program he was using. Maybe it was just some generic like Google Docs or Apple Notes or something, but he pretty much had a shot list and his shot list was so much more in-depth than my shot lists are. Usually mine are just a rough Mm -hmm. outline like, hey, get this shot, get this shot. His shot list was a list of shots with like picture examples of what it should look like. So that's kind of cool that he could just go down the uh, go down the list and check them off. And he was coming up with a lot of creative ideas, which made me think, I don't know if I spent enough time on my shot list to get new, unique, creative ideas that are different from something that anybody could come up with. Because you always think of the standard shots. It's like, okay, get a wide, get a medium, get a tight, uh, do a pan, whatever it is. But having some shots, like there was one where they propped up a piece of glass and stuck a bunch of dirt on the glass and then shot up under it. And I was like, I would never have thought of this. So just, just kind of thought to myself, okay, maybe it's, Let's take more time in the pre-production and come up with stuff that actually looks different than everybody else's stuff. Preparation. Exactly. <laughs> preparation H. Preparation. Yep. Preparation <laughs> is key. Yeah. I had, uh, I had, I don't know if I told you about it, but I, I did mention on the podcast recently that I signed up on these freelance sites and I had someone on Upwork reach out to me and it seemed it did and it didn't seem like it was legit because the guy's profile picture was like this chick in a bikini, but then he ended up sending the Facebook profile and they sell girls clothes. So that made sense. And he was asking for just experience, different stuff that I've actually done. So it, he knows that I actually have experience and I can do what they want. They wanted me to do Facebook ads and I sent them that. And then they, he was like, okay, I, what's your email so I can add you on to the Facebook ads or business, whatever. And then I was like, okay, sweet. But <laughs> he also said we have $15,000 per month ad budget and that we want to be doing that for the rest of 2023. But then when I went to go to reply to give him my email, it said that he's not active or something. So I thought that it may have been a scam and that they were messaging a bunch of bunch of people and now they're no longer an actual profile. So that might, might've been a scam. It it was cool to see the lead. I don't know if it's going to dwindle away, but it was potential. Did it say he's not active, like not active on the current website or did it say like the page is not active? It was like, I don't know exactly what it said. It just said that, uh, that it it was more so like on Upwork, like Upwork type kind of band. Like okay. It says act does not currently have access to Upwork and will not receive messages until access is restored. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. So my guess is that they may have been doing some spammy stuff and they got flagged. Yeah, well, maybe they come back. Fingers crossed that it's a <laughs> it's a real person. Yeah, hopefully I can get that. That first client at those beats, man. Just I'm gonna bring it up like every <laughs> every episode until it happens. One of these episodes, I'm gonna have the beats on, and then you're gonna know. But I'll probably end up telling you before. So, <laughs> what counts as a client? Like, what can I push? Like, if Paying I push customer. you, yeah. But if I would, I technically, if you like subcontract, if I'm like, hey, I got a client, but they want a website, and then you do the website under, you know, hundred percent. It's a client. Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll keep pushing. Work. I'll keep pushing the envelope for you. See what I can get you. All right. I appreciate that. What if I'm, I'm like, hey, edit this? It. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm getting I'll paid. See, it counts. Yeah, I'll see what else. Uh, in the new frames business. I'll see what I got in the in the queue for you. Maybe I can throw you some work. Um, last thing I got on my end is got a documentary shoot next week. Perfect timing for beyond the Beyond Sheet. Wow. Beyond Meat Shoot. <laughs> to see the creative process because we're shooting a documentary next week, but we don't have any involvement in the editing process. We're pretty much pre-production production, and then they're handing it off hard drive off to an editor. So it gives me the ability to shot list. We're taking all of Wednesday from like three to, you know, sunset to get B roll shots and texture shots of North Dakota. And then that gives me the chance to, come up with some more creative shots, some unique shots to make this documentary actually look 
as cool as it can, which kind of sucks because I want to use it like for my portfolio, but I don't have any of the editing. I'm not doing any of it. So I might do a little director's mm-hmm. cut, almost like uh, Zack Snyder did with Batman. Um, or is that what it was? Batman? Uh, and, and put together my own little documentary. But yeah, we'll see. It's it's. I'm super excited to come up with some creative shots for the documentary. So what would be a director's cut? Is that just like B-roll of you behind the scenes or is that just your own footage that you you captured director's cut is so basically in hollywood it's like the director directs everything and then they edit it um the editor edits it and the director never gets the not every time but sometimes they don't get the final say so if a director has a scene and then they cut out that whole scene the director's cut will have their version of the documentary or their version of the movie so it's just like a whole nother movie. It's just some scenes are added. Some uh, dialogue might be switched up, whatever it is. It's just a little bit different of a movie. Interesting. Yeah. That's weird. I, I, I figured they would just be there the whole time, but I guess it's just the shots that they're directing is all they do, right? Yeah, and they get some say in like the editing and everything, but obviously some people might have final say, the Martin Scorsese's, the, you know... Christopher Nolan's people like that, they might get final say, but when you're working with say Marvel or DC or Disney or something, you might not always have the final say. So I think that's what happened with Zack Snyder when he was doing Batman is that DC had a little bit of say in it on how they wanted to release it. So then Zack Snyder, they also released a director's cut. That was his version. Which one was better? I don't know. I I don't know if I, I don't know if I saw either of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Last thing for me is just uh, that Google Ads meeting with my buddy's mom. We were supposed to catch, uh, connect this week, but I, I don't know. Something happened. So hopefully we'll be able to connect next week. And if that might be my first client, so we'll we'll see how it goes. I'm going to try and get her in. I also had a uh, Rick called me, the guy from Florida, Tampa, that wants to do his little thing that I talked about. I, I think I talked about, but he talked about to me and uh we should be connecting with him next week too so that was the guy Eddie set you up next with? week yep yep that should be good then so ho- hopefully we can connect with them next week and get some get something in the books <laughs> get those beats on the ears that's what i want to see same here same here man <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm assuming everyone at the gym too is wanting wanting it. They're like, Tyler, you don't have anything in your ears. <laughs> you're like, man, get some beats. And you're like, I got some. I just can't use them. <laughs> exactly. Cool. All right. Well, let's move into this week's uh, news story. You mentioned it earlier, but Twitter is rebranding and changes the name to X. Just the letter X, not EX, not EXX. Just the letter X. Tyler, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, rebrandings are always... Uh, Something you see, Facebook did it with Meta. Uh, now Twitter is doing it with X, Elon Musk. Yeah, you bring up the point about Meta. Everyone still calls it Facebook. Same thing with Google. Google rebranded to Alphabet. Everyone still calls it Google. Everyone still goes to Google.ca, Google.com, whatever it is. So that just made me think of that where I, I, I'm pretty sure... Elon already did this, where if you go to x.com, it brings you to Twitter or something like that. So it'll be interesting how that goes. It might still be called Twitter, but it seems like they're pushing for X because you got all these years built up for branding around Twitter. Like that stuff doesn't happen overnight. It takes years to actually build up. Like when you see the golden arches, you know exactly what that is. So it it, it takes time. So it, it's... It's a big move. Um, we'll see how it pays off. What do you think? I didn't know. First of all, I didn't know that Google switched to Alphabet. That must have slid right under the radar for me. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see if they go full rebrand. Like, hey, we are now X. Twitter's not a thing. Like, Twitter.com will redirect you to X.com. Um, but if they change, like, I was looking on my phone, and maybe I just haven't updated the app, but the app, the logo is still the Bluebird It still says Twitter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're planning on changing that Mm -hmm. stuff or if it's just, hey, X is now like kind of the same company as Twitter, but we're going to keep it the same thing. Because the other thing we were talking about is, you know, Twitter did become a verb, right? If you're going to go tweet something, everybody knows what tweeting it is. And if that goes away, what is going to be the new thing? Yeah. 
it's interesting because when you're talking about that, are they really going to change all the the branding around it? Is the name going to get changed to X? Is the logo going to get changed? Are they going to get rid of the bird, <laughs> kill the bird? So it's interesting to think about that because they put all this time and effort into it. But when I, I believe we talked about this a long time ago, where Twitter want or Elon's goal with Twitter is to have an everything app. So that's why they're going with X. So it's everything in there and they can build it up into everything instead of just being Twitter. Now it can be everything. Yeah, he's got to have some sort of goal behind that. And if everything app, I think we talked about this the time you're mentioning, Dubai have some sort of app like that where you can oh. literally do whatever you want on this everything app. So if, if Elon is trying to move it to more of that sort of uh, service, then it would maybe make mm -hmm. sense to change it from Twitter because everyone knows Twitter as a social media platform where you tweet and have conversations. But if he's going to be adding new services, new features, new things you can mm -hmm. do on there, you maybe don't want to add that to an existing brand that is Twitter. You need to change it so people are like, oh, this is a whole different thing. Right. And then at the same time, it brings up the question because there's like all the threads and it's like, are you going to tweet still or are you going to X or what? what's it going to be called? Is it still going to be called a tweet? Because I don't know, is it going to make sense? So it's a lot of decisions that have, have to go in there. And at the same time, when you think about it, Elon Musk is a personal brand. And the reason why there's so much value in, say, Tesla, Cyberlink, SpaceX, and now Twitter is because of Elon Musk. If Elon Musk were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, all these companies, their brand value and their stock value is going to significantly decrease. So it's just everyone's just behind Elon because he has that personal brand and he's such a genius and he's like one of a kind in our generation. So it's basically Elon Musk plus Twitter plus SpaceX plus Tesla. Yeah, I'm excited to see what they do with it. I've always thought about rebrands. They're super interesting because like we said, we can go the route where, okay, we're changing the whole thing. We're offering different services, different products, or you can just do a rebrand where it's like, okay, we're just changing the name because we've had this conversation before that I want to change Bennett Creative Media to something else because long-term, I don't want my name in it. So that rebrand looks a little bit different, but it is hard to rebrand. You don't realize how many things actually go into you need a logo name the website change all of the facebook handles all of your content all of your documents your contracts your invoice i don't realize how much actually goes into it i'm like what if i forget something what if a year down the road i'm like oh i'm still better creative media on that thing need a new sign <laughs> oh, i need new i need new stickers on my van yeah <laughs> no a sign right behind you oh gosh yeah that would suck <laughs> That's the least of my worries. Just, just got your little, your neon, lo, your neon sign. Now you got to have to get a new one. Yeah. But I think that's maybe more so something where I start to grow editors and I'd, it comes be more of a business because right now I'm still tied to, like you said, Easton Bennett is so much tied with the business that, you know, if you're working mm -hmm. with the company, you're also working with me, but more so down the road, if we can separate those a little bit, that's maybe when the uh, branding should change or the branding should happen but do you want to get ahead of the horse you know but do you want to get the yeah horse yeah. ahead of the car horse cart, cart. The yeah whatever, whatever you want to call it you always say it but tackling this from a marketing perspective and website when you do end up rebranding and changing your name you're going to lose a lot of authority on google and your website traffic if you say do get a, say hundreds thousands hundreds of thousands of views every month because you have that name value and if you end up changing it and changing the url even if you do set up all the url redirects it's still going to significantly impact your website's performance so that's one thing to also to consider if you are going to be rebranding yeah right now i don't even know if my website's doing any crazy numbers where it would matter so that's why i'm thinking maybe a rebrand now is better than something five years down the road. Yeah. But I th is it on here? 1625 Studios. Does that really say you do video or what what are you gonna what are your services gonna be? Is it still gonna be video or that doesn't scream video to me? No, and that's that's the the reason I put that on the notes because that's the one that I was I think we had a conversation, it had to have been over a year ago now, where I wanted to rebrand yeah. to something that was out of there. And I was 
pull in with words. I mean, studios, a lot of the times points towards some sort of creative work. Like I was just working on this beyond shoot and the guy, it was his last name and then studios. Uh, so that kind of tied to video, but, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be 1625 studios. 1625 means nothing to me minus. I just thought the numbers look cool in that order. Um, but I don't know if I would want indications that I don't want video in the, in the title. I don't want marketing in the title. So I think you just need to pick one of those buzzwords, whether it's studios or, uh, you know, what's another one? Digital media. Media. I don't uh, even know if I love the word media all that much. Yeah. You know, digital is not yeah. bad. New frame digital. But yeah, I just want something that ties to it. And I think especially uh, in the video world, people they're searching for a specific thing. So you don't really need it in the name. Like I don't need, you know, elephant video productions or whatever it is. Productions might be there, but productions could be anything, you know, are you doing music mm -hmm. for a wedding? Are you doing uh, live cameras? Are you doing photos? Whatever it is, are you just doing events? So yeah, I think you just need to pick one of those buzzwords. I don't think it matters a whole lot if the, if the name doesn't point directly at video. Yeah. I'm looking at your website right now and I'm just thinking about different optimizations that you could do because what you were saying when people actually search, what you want to do in your title is actually have your services there. So like your homepage shouldn't be Bennett Creative Media, which it currently is. You should change this to say Minot North Dakota Video Company or Minot North Dakota Video Production and then dash Bennett, Bennett Creative Media. Just so it like get you get those keywords there on and then Google, you mean? when people say yeah on google and like the title and whatever someone actually searches say video production minot or whatever i don't know what videographer minot whatever they're searching for you're going to come up or maybe videographer north dakota or something like that it's just getting those keywords in there as opposed to just bennett creative media because the only way someone finds you is if they're searching bennett creative media maybe i can be your first client then Maybe you can do all my SEO shit. I'll help you out, man. We'll we'll get you ranking. We'll get you up there. Get you on Google Search Console, and You're like, goddamn, yeah. give me them beats, boy. <laughs> we'll crush it. We'll, we'll get you a lot of organic traffic. There we go. Maybe I should uh, look into a rebrand. Wouldn't be the worst thing ever. Twenty twenty four, release it. That'd be big year. Big year. 2024, 16, 25 studios. What does it mean? I don't know. What do you want it to mean? <laughs> I thought it was cool. So that's why I did it. And now I'm doing it. And I think it's about time to get into this week's topic, sacrificing short-term discomfort for long-term exponential gain. And I think a reason that this came up, I was at the gym. It was pretty early in the morning. I was. I feel like I always get a lot of random thoughts, especially when I don't have my beats and I can't, <laughs> can't listen to music while I work out. I, my mind just races. So I was thinking that... I've been paying my student loans for, I don't know, maybe close to a year, if not more. So $1,000 every month is coming out of my paycheck every single month. And I was just thinking, I'm almost at the end. What if I just stayed a couple extra months to get a couple extra thousand dollars? What the paycheck would be like if I wasn't putting it, putting it towards my student loans? And the entire time, me staying with my job, the reason why I do stay with my job the crutch I keep saying is because I have my student loans and I need that money coming in so I can make sure that I pay it off. But now that I'm getting close to the end, I'm thinking, what if I maybe just stay a couple extra months? So that's what I was just thinking about is I'm sacrificing this long-term exponential gain for short-term gain because right now my income's fixed. So if I were to stay, I'm getting the short-term fixed income. Whereas if I quit and I started working on my business, working on my personal brand, the YouTube videos, like I was saying, the short form content, if I were able to build that up and create a massive brand, a business, whatever it is, that's going to create exponential gain where it the sky's limitless, where right now I'm fixed. So that's, a, that's kind of where it came from. Did you have any... I mean, past experiences in with you in doing this? Yeah, I do, but I don't want to get into them yet because I want to ask you questions on what you said first. So first okay. thing is, do you feel like that, you know, the student loans is your crutch? Obviously you said yes, but do you think you're just looking for the next crutch and delaying the inevitable of quitting? 
<laughs> I think so. I think there's fear. There's fear there, obviously, because if there wasn't fear, I'd be like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. But I think that's normal to have that fear, but it's what's going to get you to the point of, I know it's fearful. I know I'm scared, but like, I just got to do it. Honestly, I don't know. Is this short term discomfort? Because I, I have the cushion of a, I live at home. B, I have minimal expenses. C, I have money saved up currently. So I have a lot of that stuff that makes it safe and secure to leave my job to be able to take the risk for a few months. Like I have, like once I, once I do get my student loans paid off, I have enough money. If I stay in my current situation, I have enough money to cover like for two or three years. So it's like, it just depends on how much money I start spending, say for new frame. And it's like, at the same time, that's saying I don't ever get any clients for new frame. If I get any clients, then I start getting that income coming in and it gives me more time to go there. So sh- yeah, short answer long. <laughs> That's the thing I was thinking. Cause I was going to pitch like having a runway of money, which it's, I was going to say at least have six months, but if you have two to three years, man, I'd say fucking quit. My, right I, told you my expense, I told you my expenses are extremely minimal right now. So it, yeah. like, live at home. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you still got to think about eating. I don't know what you buy for eating and all that stuff. But if they are minimal, I mean, yeah, that's that's the time to do it. Because I remember now going into your question about if I've ever experienced this is the first year when I uh, moved back to Minot. Uh, I think I started my business the first eight months. I made like $8,000. And I told myself all I need to make is enough to cover my car payment, which was $340 a month, which puts you at whatever, just under four grand a year. So I said, I just need to make four grand this year and I'll, I'll be fine. And I went from 8,000 to the next year. I think I made about 35 to after that, you know, it just exponentially went up. So the first two years, if you're looking at that and you make $43,000 in two years, it's a little bit scary. So having that runway of money, to be able to support, you have to know internally that the first few months might suck. Like you might have one or two jobs for three or four months. If we're lucky. Yeah. If you're in a pace, (laughs) at our current pace, we're never going to end those beats. Yes. And if you're, (laughs) if you're mentally prepared enough to know, it's like, I'm not going to get these clients. Like I have to be willing to not get them. And I have to be willing to just wait it out because a lot of people are like, I'll quit and I'll have this runway, but hopefully I don't need the runway because I'll quit and then I'll make, you know, $70,000 my first year. That does happen, but it's more realistic that it's a very slow trajectory where that beginning is going to be freaking shitty, man. Uh, And then you get going, Mm -hmm. but it's nice because you're double teaming it right now where it's like, you're going through that shitty slow growth, but you're also still getting the paycheck. But it's like, could you Mm -hmm. go through that shitty slow growth area faster if you didn't have the job. That's how I view it. Yep. Yeah, I definitely agree with you because that's how this topic came up because if I were able to quit or if I did quit, I would be able to do so much other stuff on the side. So I'd be able to work more on my podcast. I'd be able to create more YouTube videos for my business and for both personal. I'd be able to work on my short form content for both business and personal. It gives me so much extra time where I was saying this week, I was overwhelmed with the amount of work that I had to do. I didn't even get everything done. I kind of just like, "Ah, fuck it. I'll just (laughs) save it for next week. And it it took up all my time and I didn't have any free time to be able to really do all the stuff that I wanted to do, unfortunately. So if I were to quit, it, it gives me a lot of time. It buys me a lot of time back to be able to do that and then actually have like, say, the cold outreaches and being able to message people and be like, hey, I'll do this for you. Hey, I'll do that for you. Yeah, I'm a big fan also of taking risks to almost light that fire under your ass. So the reason I got my truck, you know, $60,000 truck, probably not a very good thing to do. Not very smart because it's a depreciating asset. But I thought if I buy this truck, I'm going to have to work harder to be able to pay for this truck. So I like making those decisions based on, it might not be the smartest thing to take big financial risks and then try to figure it out on the back end, but it did drive me. And now it's like, okay, now I have this extra thing I got to worry about. So I have to work extra hard to make sure that works. Same thing with uh, the beginning of the year when we started this coaching program, pretty expensive coaching program. I got to figure out how to make that money because one of my favorite sayings is when your back's against the wall, you're going to figure it out. You're not just going to 
you know, lay your weapons down and say, okay, I'll just go back to whatever I was doing before. You're going to figure out a way to make it work. So that's what I mm-hmm. like. Even if you take this uh, risk and you quit your job, you're then going to have an extra 40 hours a week where you're like, I'm going to figure out how to make this work. Cause that's literally my only option. Right. And it just buys up a lot of, a lot of my time. And I, th- I think we were, we've said on a past podcast, 2024 is the year. So we'll hopefully get there. It, it's just, it's tough because I feel like the job that I do have, it's, it's really good. It like the amount of freedom I have. Right. That's the only issue. It's like I have a 0% chance of getting to my goals if I stay at the job. Whereas if I quit and do this, I actually have a chance. So in the worst case scenario, I could quit, try this out for year, two, however many years. Worst case scenario, end up back where I was. Yeah. I don't know if you have the same job. Hopefully you can work out a deal where it's like, hey, if can you guys take it back in two years if I suck balls? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'd try and go somewhere else and make some more money potentially. Yeah. I don't know. Like I was saying, this job's like allows me, it gives me a lot of freedom to do what I want when I want. Um, yeah. And like the work's not terribly hard and there is some shitty stuff aspects to it, but I it's think- something. I think if you gave yourself a two year window that you would be making as much as you are now, uh, if not more in a two year window where you would never look back after you, after you quit. I, I think I'd have to agree with that because it, I, 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 I need to start looking at it where having confidence in myself that I'll actually be able to go out there and get clients and get work to, to come in. Because if, if I can't get a client in two years, like <laughs> That's just shit, man. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the one thing I'll say is when you do quit, whether that's November or 2024, whatever it is, to make sure that you focus on the things that are actually going to be bringing in clients rather than, because that's the one thing I started when I was doing. I didn't do any client lead generation, no outreach, no nothing. I just tried to, I'm going to make content and people will come to me. It doesn't work as pretty as you think it is that people are just is people are going to come to you. They, they're not going to just yep. flock to you. You have to know. actually put in the work to get the clients. So it might be awesome when you do quit and you got all this extra time and you're like, wow, I can make as many podcasts I want and as many <laughs> videos as I want, but you still have to focus yep. on the thing that actually drives sales. And that is yep. the sales process. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely one thing that I need to do. And I've been thinking recently about that because like I was saying before we started the podcast is after this, I'm going to probably read, but that's what I was thinking about the other night is should I just not be reading and focusing on the business and taking that 30 to 60 minutes and trying cold outreach, cold DMS, whatever it might be and trying to get new, new clients. And because I know I like to read because it makes me feel like I'm doing something and being productive. But at the same time, if, I don't have a business and I don't have any clients. I think my time's better spent trying to get those clients. Yeah, there's a fine line you can walk between doing things that you enjoy doing and that you think are important to do, like reading. But there's also areas where you can maybe cut down a little bit. You know, I know you don't watch Netflix or anything, but someone listening, if you're like, oh, I don't have any time, there's always areas of time that you can, you know, shave off. So you can do more productive work, whether that be getting clients or, you know, if it's reading, you take time away from reading to reach out to clients. But if that's something you really value, don't do that. But maybe you uh, can send some Instagram messages while you're eating dinner or when you're taking a shit and you got five minutes, you can send a lot of messages in five minutes. But you might have to prep that by, you know, one day you come up with a list of 25 people you're going to reach out to. And then that week you're, you're slowly reaching out to them. So a lot of people think they don't have time when in reality there's a lot you know mm-hmm. get off tiktok stop watching netflix yep. stop yep. going out to eat whatever it is uh there there's definitely time you can save to put in more work for your business that's actually a really good idea that i might might pursue do you have any tips or recommendations on coming up with a list of people to reach out to i think you need to decide first of all who your ideal client is so let's say, you know, if it's 
I want a business that does this. They need, they got a marketing team and they want Google ads and, you know, they have a CEO figure out like the people you're actually going to be reaching out to. And then do you want to do local? Do you want to do remote to start? I would say local is probably the easiest. I don't know about your area, but maybe it's not, maybe it's, you know, like you said before, you want to find websites where people are not utilizing their ads well, where they're going to places that are not remote. So someone in Windsor, Ontario is getting hit with it when it should be down in Florida, whatever it is. So come up with the ideal person that you'd be reaching out to make that list. And then I'd gorilla reach out to him as much as possible, you know, send him a cold email, uh, maybe send him a message on Instagram, connect with them on LinkedIn, comment on some of their posts and just get in front of those people somehow. Yeah, this actually reminded me of what something that happened, I think today, where I was doing research for one of my clients to try and come up with ideas. And I searched Custom Home Builder Toronto or whatever I searched. And one of the sponsored ads that came up, I ended up going through the sponsored ads and clicking to, to the websites. And the one that came up, they're in Michigan. So I'm going to reach out to them after this podcast and be like, yo, I see you're running ads. That's awesome that you're running ads. Uh, but I searched Toronto. And as I can see on from your website, you guys don't service Toronto. You guys service Michigan. So I can, I'd be happy to help you guys out run your ad, Google ads properly. Yeah. And that's something where I think you need to go into these messages with a value prop. It, I always think about if I was to message an athlete or a celebrity of some sort, you can tell them that, but bring them a piece of value right away. They aren't targeting the proper locations. <laughs> so yeah. But <laughs> all you're doing, all you're doing there is you're telling them what they're doing wrong. You know, tell them how they can fix it, give them some sort of something and provide them value of like, Hey, here's my proposal. Like it's doesn't have to be a full length one, but say like, Hey, you're doing your ads wrong. I would love to come in there. I can just go in your console. It'll take an hour. I can set it up. I would change this, that, the other thing. And then they might be tied in a little bit more. So try to stay away from telling them what they did wrong. Cause then they get super defensive and more so go into it saying, Hey, here's as much as like, I'm giving you this because I don't want you to look like a fucking idiot. I might offer like 15 minutes free where we'll just walk through your back end and I'll offer a few tips. And then that, and then that gives them the opportunity to say yes or no. Yeah. I'm because trying I've to think tried how a few you... cold, cold DMs and or cold emails and I haven't gotten any responses yet. So I'm trying to work it right now. D- uh, DMs are, DMs are tough. Uh, emails. E- or I mean, sorry. emails. Yeah. Sorry. Emails, emails are really hard. I get so many cold emails and I never answer them. One I did see the other day. I'll send you an example of it though. I got one from a gal and she was super upfront. She lost me on the second email cause she is an idiot, but the first email was super <laughs> honest. It's like, Hey, I uh, just got laid off from my job and me and so-and-so just started a social media company. Uh, and then it was pretty, it was super gen- or not generic, but super genuine. Like we know we're just starting, but we know we can create good content. Uh, let me know if you want to see a couple samples of the content and what we can provide you. Um, it won't cost you anything. It'll be super free, but she was super genuine about like, Hey, we just started this. We get, we just started this. So we're not going to be some huge agency. And then the second one was, Oh, you should book a call with my strategy person, Andrea. Here's her Calendly link and it'll take you 15. And I was like, okay, now you're getting a little salesy on me. Um, but something like that. And then as far as, uh, the, the DMing method goes, you got to do the old Trojan horse. What I learned in the course, man, you got to get that first. Yes. Where they're unsuspecting that a sales pitch is coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I read through it the other day and yeah, I think it was, I think it was good. So I'll have to, I'll have to just start outreach. That's, that's what it's going to be. Get that first client. Outreach, yeah. outreach, outreach. And you can tweak it a little bit so it fits more so what you're talking about, but you kind of get the general bones and the breakdown of what that'll look like. But pivoting back into uh, the topic of the episode here, a lot of this stems back to short term discomfort. These things that you're going to be doing uh, when you do quit your job, but what does short term discomfort look like for the people that are listening, Tyler? What's some things that they might have to expect? Uh, when they're going through these first stages of quote unquote business. I, I've always somewhat admired this and I've never actually gotten to that point. And maybe if I were to quit 
and I would be a lot more frugal with my money. But seeing people like eat ramen or just, you know, that struggle, I love seeing that grind and I always like admire it, but I, I never actually put myself there. So maybe that's something I need to do and change up my environment. Maybe we can do a podcast on environment. Um, but yeah, that, doing that, living at home is an option. I know it's becoming a little bit more normal in this day and age just because of the cost of living is increasing so much. Um, I'm currently living at home. I know you lived at home when you were first starting out. So that could be another one living in a small apartment. I know I was, I saw an ad today and it's, I'm uh, how I, how I've said, I'm going to be trying to get into Ironmans and I got hit with this bike rack in yeah. this guy's apartment where it's just like on the wall. And I'm like, oh man, that would be cool. Like, and the cool part was like your own apartment in your own city with your own aesthetics and all like all your everything hanging on the wall and stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh man, that would be cool. But I'm here at La home. So it's like that short term sacrifice living in a small car apartment, not having a, a car. Maybe you have a bike instead to get around or maybe you just take the bus or whatever it might be. It's just living below your means. No new, new nice clothes or new clothes. But yeah, I feel like those are some of the options and I'm living a few of them. Yeah, I know you never put ramen in your body because your body is a temple, but <laughs> I, I live on that truly by is. choice. I don't even have to grind. I just like ramen. Hey man, you gotta you gotta be healthy. If if your body and your mind is in that top or top mental and physical state, how are you gonna be able to operate at that top physical and mental state? I know other people do it somehow. It probably isn't as hard as I make it seem. Just maybe pop a multivitamin, you're all set. But I think if you're fueling your body well and properly, I think that helps out a lot. Oh, for sure. But sometimes you know if you gotta eat sixty nine cents ramen because you haven't had a client in a couple of years. It's what you got to do. One of my one of my favorite uh, stories, Mark Cuban always says to live like a student. I think the first time he sold his first business, he took a plain uh, sat coach. He just sold his business for millions and millions, maybe even billion dollars. And he sat coach and just enjoyed it. Like he didn't go yeah. do any fan. He didn't go buy a car. He didn't go buy a big Rolex. Uh, he was still living like a student, even though he had all of this money. So I think if you can keep that mindset, uh, you know, lower the expenses as much as you can, uh, live like a student, like a literal college student where you got no money, no job, mm -hmm. all of that excess money, you're going to be able to put back into the business. It's going to be grow a lot more. Yeah. And you have to make sure that lifestyle creep doesn't creep in because I know a lot of people, once they start making more money, they ha they start spending more money. So it's like, even though you're, what is it? Your money coming in is increasing. Your expenses need to either stay, stay the same or lower or not increase at the same rate that your wage or whatever your money coming in is. But in another scenario, similar to Mark Cuban is Alex Hermosi, he always talks about it where he was living in like a five bedroom apartment with like six other people. He was sharing a bedroom with someone else and he was in like a really prime location and he was paying like $500 per month. He talked about a couple of his roommates had dogs. There was piss and shit everywhere and he just went through that shit. So it's like just being willing to, and like he said he was making like 30 plus thousand dollars per month at this point and he's paying $500 for rent and he's paying like $10 per day for food. Like he'll go out to say uh, Chipotle and get a couple $5 meals or $10 meals. And so he's living at the very bare minimum of his needs. He has a roof over his head. He's got food and he is at minimal expenses, but he's making really good money. Like he's making more money than 90 seven percent of people at that point maybe and that's what more. and that's what you got to do i maybe so how i view it even if you do have that income increase let's say you 10x your income your spending shouldn't 10x it can maybe 1x or 2x yeah. right you can still uh you know do a little bit more but it shouldn't grow i like how you said that shouldn't grow at the same rate that your income is because then you're not making any progress you're staying at the same profitability now you just are spending way more and now you have to upkeep that lifestyle with maintaining that profit whereas if you keep those same expenses you might have an influx but the day you have a down flux i don't know if that's a word but you're fine because you still have you maintain that same level of expense yeah you hear a lot of people where they're they make a lot of money 
but they're poor because they spend all of their money. It's like, sure, you make $1 million a year, but you spend $1.5 million per year and now you're in debt. So it's like that balance of making sure like you make a million dollars a year, you can spend fifty hundred thousand dollars a year and then you got all that extra money coming in. Yeah. And that's a mindset that's, it's hard to get for some people, but you, you got to work on it. You have, you have to do that, man. That's what you got to do. You got to sacrifice that short term gain for that exponential long term gain. Exactly. And then you can spend a million dollars a year when you're making 10 million a year. <laughs> when do you, when do you get to that point where you do say increase that? Because I know you do want to always invest back into your business. Where do you get to that point? Like if you really break it down, the amount of money that you truly do need to survive is not as much as people make it out to seem like you could probably survive on thirty to fifty thousand dollars per year and live rather comfortably, you might not be able to live in New York. You might not be able, might not be able to live in Chicago, but you could find somewhere where you could live, and that could be like a good income where you can live comfortably, do what you want. So it's like, where where's that line, or where do you think? Yeah, I think you get to a point where your income is at where it's not the bare minimum where you're at the expense where it's like, ah, I can do this, but I don't enjoy it or I'm still eating ramen. But you get to a point where it's, I'm comfortable. I get to do what I want. I can go golfing when I want, but you don't need to have a $1.5 million house and a $300,000 car. And I think that's the sweet spot. What that number is, is probably different for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't think it's as much as people think it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting because you can get to that 10 million point and maybe you still stay at 30 or $50,000 a year, but there's other people that get to that I point wouldn't. and they spend it all or spend. Yeah, I know. Lifestyle creep. Yeah. Well, even if, if you're making $10 million a year, you can live on 250 K and that seems low. Yeah, that's pretty low. No, you could do for 250 K a year a lot. I don't think people realize how much money that is. Yeah. I yeah. You just never touched it in your life and it's like you don't you, you can't even really fathom it. It's like Yeah. Yeah. It's That's, definitely a good what's amount. that? $20,000 a month. What do you need for $20,000? It's more than that. It's like 21 33 Stop bad. You'd be living no. in a nice house. <laughs> yeah. You could literally spend 10,000 expenses and then whatever you want. 10,000 expenses. That's a pretty nice car. Pretty nice house. Pretty nice gross cars. grocery bill. <laughs> yeah. Personal chef. Yeah, exactly. Um, Tyler, what else you got on uh short term discomfort? Anything? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's just being willing. I, I don't know. It's tough for me to talk on this because <laughs> cause I'm not willing to do it right now. <laughs> So you will 2024. Yeah, I don't know. What do, what, what do you want to say to wrap it up since I can't talk on it? 2024, I'm going to put a drone strike on your house if you don't uh, <laughs> don't quit. And then we'll have this repeat part two episode. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it's super necessary. Hopefully you put yourself in a situation uh, like I did when I moved back to Minot two years. I was living in my parents' basement uh, and that allowed me the flexibility. But it's harder if you are living a lifestyle that you enjoy now. Or just try to build up that runway uh, where you got some money to cover any expenses for the next six to 12 months uh, and then go for it. And not going for it, you know, you can always go back and get a regular job. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I stop doing video in two years, I could always go get a regular job doing marketing somewhere uh, and I wouldn't be out anything, but at least I tried. I like it. I like it. Tyler, what do you got for this week's business idea? Yeah, so I was struggling to come up with this, come up with an idea at least. And what this is, is a way to get kids out more and playing and doing stuff. So I don't know, I just put it the name as Playtime app. And what it would be is controlled by the parents where instead of giving, say, uh, an allowance, it would be you give them time. So you give them time on phones, giving them time on video games. So it's like 
I'll give you an hour if you go cut the grass for me. Or I'll give you an hour if you go hang out with Billy for two hours and play outside. So it's a way to give that, make them go out and actually do stuff. Because I think we're getting in a world where we're really disconnected or actually we're really connected and we're disconnected from the real world. So that's what I was trying to think about where I heard someone say or tweet or whatever it was that less teenagers are going to get their license right when they're able to. And people were saying it's because of FaceTime, because of Zoom, you video games. You don't really need it. And I actually just saw something right before this that video game usage has took a drastic spike. And you don't really need to go out and drive to somewhere anymore because now we're so connected through technology. So it's just a way to disconnect from technology, get outside, get out playing, do some chores, whatever it might be, in exchange for, say, uh, an hour on a video game or an hour on a phone. How do you balance that with still giving them enough time to be able to learn the world that they are going into? Because obviously, 10 years from now, who knows what it's going to be where you don't want someone to just be like the Amish where they've never seen lighting or technology. How do you balance that? So it's like, okay, we can still put them in the real world. They can get a good job. They're going to be smart, even if it's tech, you know, because you don't want to take away too much of it. That's the argument I always hear. I, th- I think you do. I, you, you can't, you, you can't, I don't know the way to phrase this. You can't always get what you uh, want. <laughs> no, I'm trying to phrase this properly, but you 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 have to develop soft skills. And this is a way to develop those soft skills if you're making them go out and hang out with people in person. If if I'm con- connecting only with you through video and our technology, I'm not going to have those soft skills to talk to people in person. So this is developing a lot of those soft skills that you communication, communication is huge. Being able to connect with people on a real surface level aspect. And like, if, if people aren't able to do that, I, I just don't know how they're really going to be able to survive. You like, and, and going to your point, I don't think you need technology to survive and do well. There's a lot of these blue collar jobs that don't require that. My neighbor was actually just talking to me the other day and he was like, yeah, I know nothing about technology or computers or anything. And I was trying to explain what I do for a job and he didn't even understand what I did, but he has a really good job that's in the blue collar world where he's a mechanic, I believe. So those types of jobs, you don't really need it. And those jobs pay well. So I think it develops a lot of good soft skills. And at the same time, you're not completely alienating them from say technology. And I honestly... I think technology is like our downfall. Like it's taken us, taking all this personal interactions away. You sound like an old lady. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I agree though. Uh, I I mean, the soft skills are super important, but I do think there should be some, because yeah, the blue collar job is good now, but I think the, the build out of the technology era, those jobs are going to increase the further and further we get into the future. Whether that's 10 years, whether that's 50 years, I don't know. But I think there's a balance of having both. You could look at it the same way where everyone was thinking that robots were going to take away the blue collar jobs. But look at look at the jobs that they're taking away. They're taking away all the white collar jobs first. And now they're coming for the blue collar jobs 10 years. (laughs) That's what they thought 10 years ago. (laughs) Uh, But no, yeah, I agree. Um, It's funny that we talk about this because both of our jobs rely strictly around technology and only technology. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All and right. Tyler. Going out and building those personal relationships face exactly. to face. I haven't seen a person in four I, years. Actually for you, you do, you do, but I don't. You'll get there. You'll get there. Young Padawan. <laughs> Tyler, anything okay. else? Oh, that's everything. 2024. Cool. Mark, 20. mark your calendars. Market. That's episode 48 of the Midnight Entrepreneur. If you have any questions you'd like us to cover or answer, email us at the Midnight Entrepreneur at, e- at, g- at email.com. At gmail.com. If you found value in this content or found this entertaining, share this with a friend or post it on your story. If you really enjoyed the show, we'd love a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Talk to you guys next week for another episode of the Midnight Entrepreneur.
Maturity is achieved when a person postpones immediate pleasures for long-term values. Joshua L. Liebman.